Hello there, my name is Lily Perry and in this video I'm going to walk you through the process I took to create this large still life self portrait and landscape painting. The first thing I started out with was sketching my ideas for the composition. I had found this really cool mirror in an antique shop and wanted to use it in a painting. So that was my initial starting point. As you can see, it went through a few iterations before I landed on something that I really liked. This is the final setup. I found this passion fruit on one of my walks, just growing on the side of the road in some bushland. And here's that really cool mirror I was telling you about. It kind of looks like a porthole on a ship, and that's me. And here's a close up of those passion fruit. I really like the spots on them and the color. And this is the little glass honey bear jar I found. And I put a little candle behind my big jar of honey just to make it look a little bit more interesting. This time I'm using some actual rag because I wasn't real happy about using paper towel. It's not very like environmentally friendly. So I've just switched to a bit of tea towel and hopefully I can hang it out to dry and reuse it. And I'm using, well, I'm not super sure which brushes I'll end up using on this. I reckon it'll be a bunch of these. So because I'm painting something bigger, I've tried to switch up to use bigger brushes. So we'll have to see how that goes. Trying to keep it painterly and the best way to do that is not let myself use like triple zeros. And this little guy across. If you remember this one from the last video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this blue and I think that's ultramarine blue and cadmium yellow to mix the colours for the passion fruit because I think it's roughly the same green as that green apple and you can see it has spots as well. So these are the colours I've decided to go with. It's mostly my usual stuff. Because I'm painting the honey again, I'm going to go that cadmium yellow, light ochre, burnt sienna mix, and a bit of red, and some white. I think those are the colours I'll need, and I think if memory serves me correct, the base is like yellow, and God, I'll probably check my other video, that's where this kind of thing comes in handy, but... Maybe this time what I'll do is make some colour notes for myself. Because I have a feeling I'll be painting lots of these things again. If you're wondering how to choose a colour at all, I reckon the best way is obviously just experimenting. But if you start with like a pretty limited palette and mix from there, you'll get better results than just trying to buy the exact right colour for things. So. I don't really know how you exactly choose, like one thing you can do is what what I do, I pick a bunch of these up, Oof. okay, so when I'm looking at that vase, it, it is very clearly, it very clearly has cadmium red in it, it very clearly has this um, light ochre and then you can probably see that it has like red ready burnt sienna type looking things like a terracotta color hopefully you can see that that's what i'm looking at when i look at that and obviously the highlights they're pretty white um if you were going to well, the lighting depends on where you are right so if because this is inside that lighting is going to have like a lot of yellow in it if this was reflecting from the outside, depending on the day, it probably have blue in it. And yeah, that's kind of how I choose. So, um, and with painting black things like like this cat, so 
so black furry things. Um, I actually find them really fun to paint. Like um, I used to paint a lot of this dog um, called Pity, and she had she was like almost completely black, I think. And you can kind of get away with a pretty limited palette, like white, black, um, blue to reflect the sky. And I think I was also using like something similar to light ochre, like a raw sienna. But I think I remember reading raw sienna isn't great in terms of cracking, but I honestly can't remember anymore. But anyway, um, stuff that's like all black or all white is really fun to paint because it's like a lesson in how those things refract in their environment. So I highly recommend it because it's like fun and a challenge, but I also think it's not as hard as people think it is. So this is Black and Burnt Sienna. And what I'm doing is I'm matching it to this. A lot of times you don't really need a lot of colours. It's all about making an illusion anyway. Just show you this here. So this is light ochre straight out of the tube with a bit of um, binder mixed in. And I just want to show you how close the match is already. So I would say this would be my highlight colour on here. Obviously it's not the whites, but it's the lightest colour. And then what we need to mix next is we need this mid-tone, which is here and around here. And we also need a shadow. And from there, from these three colors, you can mix everything in between, like as in you can blend it in between. Normally, I think you can get away with about three, three different colors. Um, and if I had to guess, I would say I could probably get away with using a black in the shadows, or I'd want to go a blue. Maybe a blue like an ultramarine. Let's find out. Alright, so we got the light ochre there. And then, I'm going to go straight with black. Now, a lot of people will tell you that you shouldn't use um, straight black for shadows, but I really think it depends on lots of factors. I wouldn't be one to poo-poo it. I think there's rules and you learn them and then you can break them. So yeah, let's have a look at this. I reckon that's the mid-tone. And then the thing that's also going to work here in the mid-tones and the darks is using that either burnt sienna or an alizarin crimson to do the details, like the red marks on the paintings. So I think that was good. Now, get a bit more binder. Let me get a bit more of this. Because I'm working at a bigger scale this time, I'm trying really hard to remember um, to mix a bit more paint. So this time I put a little bit of um, ultramarine and see what that does. Hopefully it doesn't make it too green. Some of the consistencies of the paint is strange, like I'm not really sure why some of them come out of the tube with oil, but um, it doesn't seem to affect anything, so. Alright, this looks a little bit green to me, but let's have a look how this is. I think we could probably get away with this. So I want to try document the thought process behind how I would think about the colours for these leaves. So first of all, you can kind of see on this leaf here on the right that it's almost the same colours as the base. So that's our first clue. I would almost say you could probably use the base colours for those ones. And then on these greener ones, they're almost like a very pale mint. So. If I had to guess, I would say it's probably still a light ochre. It's probably got a bit of blue in it, but just a hint. So I'm going to test that theory out and see. And I don't really know how you get better at this except 
through trial and error. That's the <laughs> probably frustrating advice to hear, but um, there's heaps of great people out there who do books and videos about color and light and stuff like that. And one of the channels I thoroughly recommend is James Gurney's channel. I have quite a few of his books. Um, I've got the one on light and color and I think I've got a few other ones. And it's in like bite-sized chunks that you can read. So it's worth the investment of seeing if your local library has it. Um, another person I like uh, that I got some ideas from was the Richard Schmidt book. Um, the actual price of that book is, in my opinion, pretty inaccessible for where I live once you include shipping. But I'm able to get it from my local library, so my first thing to do if you have a book you like that you can't afford or maybe you just want to look at before you own is just see if your library has it. And if they don't have it, sometimes they can order things in for you, like to add to the catalogue, because when you think about it, you are the, like, you're the customer of the library, and they want to encourage people to read books, so just have a go. That's how I got the Richard Schmidt book into our library, because at the time I could not afford the book, but um, they got it in for me, and I've borrowed it many times. And um, this year I read it cover to cover, just out of curiosity, and it's definitely, yeah, just get as many books as you can from the library for free and do a bit of reading. That's what I recommend. Not every book is going to be great, but normally you can get a little chunk of something out of everything. I had a bit of trouble mixing the colour for this marble here. So I treated myself to this cerulean blue. So I'll just show you the cerulean I've mixed up. I've mixed it with white and cadmium yellow and you can see it's quite yellow but then so let's bring up here. I'll zoom in a bit. Okay. So you can see that These colors are pretty, pretty accurate, I think, for what's happening with this marble. And I couldn't get that before with the ultramarine and the cobalt. So we've come to the time-lapse part of the video. I hope this is helpful in some kind of way. I always like seeing other people's time-lapses, so here's mine. One of my main goals when I'm doing oil painting is to lay down a brush stroke and then not go over that again. And there's a couple reasons for that. And the first one is that working with oils is very different to me than acrylics. Um, it kind of slides around, so you kind of need to be confident in your brush strokes. Of course, this is just one way of doing it. I'm working what is called a la prima. There's other methods where you can do layers. That's not something I'm currently interested in, maybe in the future. The second reason is because I feel like it keeps the painting from feeling overworked. And this is just a personal preference, but these are my aspirations when I'm painting something.
By the way, if you're enjoying this video and you'd like to support my arts practice or you'd like early access, I've started a Patreon. I'll link it below in the description.
The landscape part of this painting was painted at the Tweed Regional Gallery's community picnic. This was in the middle of lockdowns and it felt incredible to be out there painting with other people. It was such a beautiful day, the views were incredible. I really love painting on plein air and unfortunately I don't do it as much as I would like to. This was two years ago, I actually went back this year as well and when I finish that new painting I'm working on I will upload another similar-ish video. So this is one of my first times using gold leaf and I really love the nature of this material. It almost feels alive. Um, I was just putting it directly onto the wet paint. As you can see, it's a little tricky. It reacts to the tiniest amount of movement in the air. Afterwards, I painted over that to create my pattern, and I just used it sparingly, I just wanted a little bit of accent. This is how the final piece turned out. I'm really proud of how it came out. It actually made it to the semi-finals of the National Portrait Galleries competition, which it unfortunately got rejected from, but then it did become a finalist in the Lethbridge Prize. If rejection is something that you're all interested in me talking about, I would be happy to do a video about it because I feel like a lot of people don't really talk about this aspect of being an artist and competing with your work. It can be really hard and you need to take good care of yourself when it happens. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I hope you'll be back for the next one. I love painting and I love sharing it with you all. See you soon.